My journey to Inc. 2013 started in Namibia, where I was born. And I would spend many nights as a child outside, and I would always be fascinated by the Milky Way painted across that beautiful, dark African sky. And the thought that always came in my mind was one of wonder. What is out there? Is it possible that on one of those specks of light, somebody is looking at me? It's this sense of wonder that has led me to Caltech and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I can now be part of uh, exploration that knows no boundaries and are truly out of this world. Today we're going to be talking about Mars. You see our solar system here. The surface area of Mars is about the same as all the land masses on Earth put together. But the atmosphere on Mars is 95% carbon dioxide. So in some cities you may feel like you're on Mars, but it's not quite the same. There's only 0.8% oxygen. And the atmosphere is very thin. It's only about 0.6% of the pressure of the uh, surface of, of the Earth. Yet the two planets share many common features. Like, for example, you see the polar caps here in these two images of Mars on the right and Earth on the left. Both planets have large canyons. On the right, you see the Grand Canyon in the United States, the largest canyon in, on Earth. It's 450 kilometers long, about 29 kilometers wide, and as deep as 1,800 meters. On your left, you see Valles Marineris on Mars, a system of canyons that's more than 4,000 kilometers long. It's 200 kilometers wide and as, as deep as 7 kilometers. Both planets have volcanoes and high mountains. Mount Everest on Earth is about 8,800 meters high. Olympus Mons on your right is 21,000 meters high. The cliffs at the edge of Mount, uh, uh, Olympus Mons is higher than uh, Mount Everest. The geology is very similar. You see on the left, Mars, and on the right, an image of the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. So if these two places are so similar, why is it that we have life and Mars doesn't? So NASA started sending in the 1997s uh, rovers to Mars so we can start studying the surface of Mars and try to answer some of the questions about why the two are so different. In uh, 2004, NASA sent two rovers there, Spirit and Opportunity, and their question was, could we find conclusive evidence that there was ever water on the surface of Mars. Well, this is one of the pictures taken from the surface of Mars by one of those two little rovers. And you see the Earth does not look nearly as impressive from the surface of another planet as we think it does. Now, those two rovers were supposed to last about 90 days. And the limiting factor would be that we expected dust to collect on the solar panels and basically block out the sun and we would have no more power to operate. But you see here a series of images taken by Opportunity that shows these uh, dust devils, these little whirlwinds come by regularly. And it turns out these things were of great benefit to us because they would come by every couple of days and blow off the dust from, all, from the solar panels and off we go again. So as a result, Opportunity is still operating nearly 10 years. But the rovers were there to do some serious work. Here's, here you see a spectacular image of a Victoria crater on Mars. And if we zoom in, you see uh, opportunity there at the edge of the crater. Now, why do we study craters? Well, crater is sort of a, uh, a freebie, if you want to, where some um, meteorite hit the surface and excavated the rocks underneath the surface for us, so we don't have to do any digging. We can just go out there and take a look at it. Here you see the evidence that there was water on Mars. Those little gray spheres you see out there is an iron mineral called hematite. And hematite most commonly forms in water. So by actually going there and identifying these minerals, we found that there must have been water on the surface of Mars at some time. Here is another example of the evidence of water on Mars, taken in Endurance Crater by Opportunity. You see these layered materials here. This analysis of this material showed that water deposited these rocks basically over a period of time. It wasn't there constantly. It was episodic floods that would come by and deposit this material in these layers, and then it would dry out again. So once we figured out that there indeed was water on Mars at some point in time, NASA decided to get a little bolder and go out back and send a large rover to Mars. And to answer the question, could the conditions on Mars ever have supported life? Well, so we built this rover. Uh, it's called Curiosity. It's about the size of a Mini Cooper car. It weighs a ton, and if the mass is fully extended, it's more than two meters tall. You see here the tests in the laboratory at uh, JPL before we launched 
the system to Mars. This is what it looked like just before we launched it in the thermal vacuum chamber while we were still testing it. The black material that the person is touching is in fact the same as the tiles that uh, you heard earlier about that was on the uh, space shuttle. It's to protect the rover and this capsule as we were flying through the um, atmosphere of Mars. Even though that atmosphere is very thin, if you do not protect the rover, it'll burn up very similarly to what the shuttle did. So the rover is tucked up in that uh, uh, module you see that the person is touching, and the ring at the top is actually the crew spacecraft that took us to Mars and dropped us off in the atmosphere, so to speak. So I'm going to show you a video of the landing, but let me just tell you what you're going to see so you can enjoy it while you're seeing it. When we arrive at the, surf uh, at the top of the atmosphere of Mars, this capsule is traveling at 21,000 kilometers an hour. And it, the entire system weighs about three tons. And then we have about seven minutes to gently land on the surface of Mars. The signal that we get from the spacecraft takes 14 minutes to come from Mars. So when you get the first signal that we've arrived at the top of the atmosphere of Mars, the rover is already on the surface for seven minutes, and that's why we call that the seven minutes of terror. So what you will see is we will enter the atmosphere with this black part, the heat shield facing forward. As we go through the top of the atmosphere, the drag in the atmosphere is slowing us down, and at the same time heating that capsule up to about 2,000 degrees or so. Once we reach the speed of about uh, 1,600 kilometers an hour, we open a special parachute, a supersonic parachute, that can slow us down even further. At that point, the atmosphere doesn't help us anymore. We have to put on extra brakes. Now, that parachute, even though it's great, only slows us down to about 160 kilometers an hour. So at that point, we drop this heat shield off, and we drop the rover out of this uh, capsule, with a jetpack on its back, and this jetpack then flies the rover slowly down to the surface, hovers about 20 meters above the surface, and then we low, lower the, the rover slowly on cables until it's safely on the ground. Then we cut the cables and fly away. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain. Fasten your seat belts, turn off your electronics. Let, join me on the landing on Mars. So, as you can imagine, since Chris never visited us, this went very f smoothly. Here we are on the surface of Mars. You, you can s barely see the shadow of the mast of the rover in the foreground here. The two gray spots you see off to the right are the blast holes that those rockets blew into the surface as we were coming down. And in the background is Mount Sharp, the mountain that is our ultimate goal for this particular uh, mission, to go drive up that mountain and study the history of Mars. This is where everything ended up after the, the day after we landed. You can see where Curiosity is in the back shell and the parachute. And if you look on the web, you can actually see images taken over time that shows the parachute is blowing back and forth in the wind as the satellites come over every day. Well, the results came very quickly. This is a type of a rock that you, if you find it on the Earth, you would recognize it as something called a conglomerate, and this forms in water. So we had the unbelievable luck that we actually landed in an ancient stream bed on Mars. Here's some more rocks like the same kind of rock. So there must have been water in this part of Mars for quite a while. So we took the rover and we drove off to the right on your screen to that light colored area there that looks like this. On Earth, if you see something like this, you would say, well, there's clearly some mud there that has dried out over time and formed rocks. So Curiosity carries a drill with which you can look at the interior of the rocks. And here you see some pictures of uh, the rocks in that area on the left and rocks on the Earth. And both of them show these sort of white veins of material. Those veins are actually material that's left in cracks in the rocks as water sort of seeps through it over a long period of time. So we knew that this area clearly had water in the past. But how much and what kind of water, we did not know until we drilled these two holes into the rocks on Mars. 
Curiosity has this drill bit that you can see in the top left in the image there. And this drill bit went in this rock, drilled a hole in there. And you notice one interesting thing. The rock itself is red, but the stuff that came out of the inside of the rock is gray. That in itself was a big discovery. Uh, people normally would think that this, the red part of Mars, the oxidation layer, would go roughly a meter into the surface, and here it's only two centimeters into the rock, and it's gray already. So we picked up that material, put it inside the rover, and analyzed it. And I have to show you a graph like this. And it showed, in fact, that this area had water over a long period of time in it. All the materials that form in water, like sulfites and so on, and clays, are present in this area. This water was not too acidic, and it wasn't too alkaline either, and not too salty. In fact, the estimate is if humans were there, they would have been able to drink this water. What is more, all the uh, ingredients of life are present in this area. So within a few weeks, we've already answered the question that Curiosity went there to begin with. The conditions of this part of Mars could indeed have supported life. Now we're on our way back to that mountain. The question is, why did it change from a wet environment, like where we had this stuff deposited, to the dry and barren thing that you see here today, which looks, by the way, very similar to where I grew up in Namibia. That's why I like Mars so much. Along the way, we're stopping. You have a bunch of scientists. They're like children in a car. Everybody wants a, a soft drink here and the candy there. So we stop at every rock every, along the way. And you can see here lots of different kinds of rocks. This is an interesting kind of rock that we came across that has these kinds of uh, fine-grained materials in it that we do not know yet whether this rock formed in water or it formed volcanically. But our question is, when did the conditions on Mars change that much? Here you see a measurement of the Martian atmosphere made by Curiosity on the right. It's called SAM 2013. And it shows a little dot, and this little dot is a ratio of two isotopes of argon gas in the Martian atmosphere. And it basically shows, since that ratio is much lower than the rest of the solar system, that the lighter version of ar argon gas in the Martian atmosphere somehow has escaped over time. What we're trying to do by driving up that mountain, studying the layered materials, the oldest rocks are in the bottom, the youngest ones are at the top, stopping at each of those layers, we will sample the rocks and try to determine when did this happen and why did it happen. But we have tantalizing evidence that there's water near the surface of Mars today. Here you see images from our orbiting satellites showing these streaks of briny water that formed during the summer months on Mars. So if we have water near the surface of Mars, maybe there may be some underground habitat still where, who knows, life might exist. These are caves on Mars. If you see them stretched a little bit, you can see the entrances of the caves there. And we would very much like to go back to those kinds of places and look under the surface of Mars if we could find evidence of life there. But for these kinds of things, you can't drive a rover in there. That'll be a little bit difficult. So what we're developing at the JPL are these kinds of things. It's called a gecko rover. It can climb upside down, just like a gecko can. And hopefully, we can take these things close to the entrance of the caves and let them climb into the caves and tell us what's going on inside. But what about outside of our solar system? There's a huge universe out there. Uh, but it's very difficult to make images of planets around other stars. But fortunately, there are indirect ways we can find them. For example, here's, here's one technique known as the transit technique. So every time a planet comes between us and its parent star, it blocks a little bit of the light, as you can see in that curve there. And we're looking for these little dips in the brightness of a star, and then it becomes back to the, the normal brightness again. So we build our, uh, a 100 megapixel camera that stares at the same 150,000 st stars every second of the day and look for these little transits. And as of January, we have found nearly 3,000 candidate planets around other stars. These stars range from ones as big as our sun, you see our sun up there at the top right for scale, to you know, stars that are 10 times, 100 times as big as our sun to ones that are a tenth of the size of our sun. So if you take the statistics into account of all of these planets, and you extrapolate to the Milky Way galaxy, you will find that there's nearly 50 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy. So our solar system suddenly doesn't look so unique anymore either. And of those 50 billion planets, a staggering 500 million of them will be about the right distance from their star, like we are from our sun, so that liquid water can exist on those planets. Just imagine, 500 million of them out there. 
What we need to do next is build these special cameras that can look at those planets, look at their atmospheres, and find those molecules that we typically associate with life. Things like water vapor, ozone, methane, those kinds of things. We are just in the beginning of the, this journey, but I hope that in my lifetime somebody would actually find the evidence of life around one of those other planets so that I can finally get the answer to my original question. Is there somebody out there looking in our direction? Thank you very much. So, Jacob, um, I wanted to ask you, are you doing anything with the Indian government? Are you doing anything so that we can also participate in this? Yes, in fact, um, not many people in this audience probably knows this, but on the 5th of November, just a couple of days from now, India will launch its first satellite to Mars. And we will actually be helping with the uh, tracking and the navigation of that satellite on its way to Mars. And in addition to that, NASA has just uh, uh, made an agreement with ISRO that, in fact, JPL and ISRO together will develop a radar satellite with which we will study the Earth. So uh, hopefully I will come back to Bangalore many more times in the next couple of years. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>